invite Jim McGrath. Jim, thank you for joining me. Now, I'm really looking forward to this because we're going to be talking all things timeful, aren't we? And uh, it'll be good for me, especially to brush up on my skills. But before we get into that, I'd like to know how you got into racing, as I did read that you wanted to start off being a jockey. Was that right? Yeah, um, I have absolutely no background in racing. My my father was in the RAF. My mum was uh, work part time uh, to supplement you know, the, the family, basically. Um, and I lived all over the country um, when I was little because my dad was posted often. But from when we came back from a spell in Germany, we went to see my mum's parents because she hadn't seen them for um, two years um, and they lived in Scotland. And during that time, it was 1963, and it was Grand National Weekend. And um, I was, me and my brothers were farmed out to various relatives, and I was staying with my mum's youngest sister. She said it's Grand National Day. Everyone's going to have a horse, and we're going up to Grandad's to watch it. So you've got, I'll, I'll read the names out, and you stop when we get to a name. So I was seven at this point, and she said 40 secrets, and I said, I want that one, which fell. Um, but... We watched that race age seven, and even though I'd, I'd never seen a race, never heard about racing, I don't know what it was, something grabbed me, and I wanted, it, it, it really fascinated me. So the next year, I watched the Grand National again, uh, and a horse called Freddie, trained in Scotland, finished second, and he finished second the following year. So like a football fan, I started following Freddie every time he ran, and that's how I became interested in racing. So from then, did you get riding lessons or maybe you know visit yards and things i know you, you've asked you know i wanted to be a jockey well i used to ride the side of the armchair as a little boy and I, um it, it was difficult because we lived on ref camps until i was 14. um i did have one or two riding lessons yeah it's interesting uh, you asked that i did but basically um i wrote away for a pre-apprentice trial because the fact that you've never ridden i'm not saying it's not a help obviously it, it can be a huge help but quite a lot of trainers, old fashioned trainers, maybe more, don't like you to learn riding somewhere else because you might learn bad habits and they'd rather teach you from scratch. So I, I had a handful of lessons and thought I could ride. But of course, when you get to a yard and you're reasonably quickly dealing even with quiet horses, thoroughbreds, big ones. I mean, they're a totally different kettle of fish. So in 1970, I had a pre-apprentice trial uh, with a leading trainer um, who was based in Whitsbury called Bill Marshall. Um, and I spent about six weeks there in the summer. And at the end of it, I mean, it's the first time I'd ever been away from from home. I mean, it's quite an eye opening experience. You know, I was living in a hostel for six weeks, uh, having sort of never been away. The head lad was very good to me. He said, look, you said you've done some exams at school. He said, if you were my son, he said, you've just about learned to ride in the time you're here and you work OK. He said, you can stay. You'll be, you, you know, you'll be fine as a stable lad. But if you were my son and you passed any exams, stay on at school. So at the time I was disappointed. But as it turned out, it, it was very sound advice. So I continued my love of racing. Um, I did two O-levels. Um, and when I'd finished those, I wrote to Timeform for a job. And it just so happened they'd won right at the very bottom in 1974, which really involved most of the day putting glue on the card that we stuck up and made race cards. So I started right at the bottom. And um, how did I get the job? Because I think you asked that in one of your questions later on. You had they give you a racing test and you have to get a percentage. So is it like a quiz kind of thing? On all yeah, the it lasted an hour. Now there were all general things about racing, and if you think about it, Hannah, you may have somebody that rides really well and knows a lot about horses. You may have had somebody with um, a, a background in um, the pedigree industry and they knew all about the pedigrees. But this was about everything. What did the flags, which we don't have anymore at race courses, what do they all mean? Um, can you name me three jump stallions, leading jumps at three leading flat stallions? Um, what's the average weight of a flat jack? All those sort of things. And I did OK. I got quite a lot of them wrong, but quite a lot of them right, too. I was about average. So I got enough to get in. Um, but there wasn't a smart job there and I wasn't ready for it uh, anyway. So uh, you started right at the bottom, which was in the old days at Timeform, the race cards that you see on sale, a bit like any race card, really, you see on sale. We used to put together um, at the offices and they had to be manually the proof that was printed from stuck together. 
So I stuck the numbers on and then the names on and then the jockeys on. It was it, it was very difficult. You know, you said that you didn't know much. Well, you thought you didn't. You thought you knew a lot until you went to time form. What's the first thing they, that you learned when you got there? Basics yeah. such, such as, I mean, you, you go racing, Hannah, and you pick up a race card and you've got, um, you see numbers, let's say 20 runner race, numbers one to 20. You see um, the top weights, nine, 10, and the bottom weights, seven, 12. But you learn things almost the first day you're there while you're doing a basic job like I was doing, that the weights are raised at, at the 48 hour stage or the overnight stage, if it's 24 hour declarations. Um, you know, I don't know if you know what the, the, the top weight in most handicaps is over jumps. Uh, you know, you learn little basic things. Then, then they don't mean much in the grand scheme of things, but they're small details that form part of the whole. So j just starting off while you're putting the glue on, oh, oh, they allocate the numbers then, do they? Why don't they allocate the five-day stage? Well, there can be 90, 90 decks at the five-day stage. You don't want a number one till 90. When there's 12 left or 14 left at the final declaration stage, we'll number them one to 14. So we don't go one, seven, 39, 54, et cetera, et cetera. It might seem all into inconsequential detail, but it was something I'd never thought of. So it was how you arrive at some of the, the things that we all take for granted. If someone was to say, what is time form? How do you, how would you describe it? Well, time form was an organization founded by Phil Bull. Um, who was um, originally a maths teacher from Pontefract, which is probably 25 miles from where he based it um, in, in Halifax, West Yorkshire. And Phil Ball was always interested in backing horses, um, but he didn't believe in a lot of the myths that people said, you know, like, oh, a good big horse will always beat a good little horse. Rubbish. He was a mathematician. If you like, he was more about science. Now, racing isn't an exact science, but it, 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 it's not inexact either. It's not approximate. It's, it's somewhere in between being exact and approximate. It lies in the middle of those two. And he wanted to take a lot of the myths out of it. So he started analysing horses on time. And with a guy called Dick Whitford, who used to be um, a, an admiral in the Navy and was also interested in racing, they formed the company. Phil Ball worked on the time aspect of it and Dick Whitford worked on the form aspect of it. And together they came up with um, a scale. So um, it was a, a scale of naught to 140, right? Mm -hmm. Naught in, in, in broad terms means no ability, nothing, useless. No, you haven't got uh, any ability whatsoever. 140 uh, is, is superlative merit. Now, why naught to 140? Now, if you think about it logically, 140 is 10 stone, which used to be the highest weight ever allocated in a handicap. It's not now, but that's how it started. So basically, horses got ratings in between and they equate to um, levels on that scale. So a horse rated... 100 is 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 40 pounds less than 10 stone um a horse rated uh 80 is 60 pounds less than 10 stone so if we pick pick one say at 126 and top weights one four or, or, or the, the highest rating you can attain is 140 one at 126 will have nine stone 14 pounds left less and so forth a rating is merely a way of expressing a horse's ability. So you might say to me, I've got a group horse, I own a group horse. And I say to you, Hannah, define that. Well, you say to me, well, it's, it's got a rating of 70. And I go, Hannah, you're mad. It can't be a group horse with a rating of 70. It would need to have a rating of a minimum a, a listed group three horse, a minimum of 95, 95 and higher. Um, these are these are approximations. So really, all a rating is, is a way of expressing a horse's ability in a figure. Now, if you follow that logically, if you've got lots of horses with figures, you can fit them in a handicap. So fitting them in a handicap means in theory, they should all finish in a straight line. So if your horse is rated 90, and my horse is rated 100, my horse, and your horse, for them to finish in a, de in, a, in a dead heat, in theory, 
they have to they have to race at 10 pounds i have my horse has to give your horse 10 pounds in in that case in a handicap they should finish together now you might say well why don't they always well i'll go well my horse is better on firm ground and your horse is better on soft ground. So all those little factors, or you might say, well, my horse is drawn um, in a low stall and yours is right on the outside in a high stall. So the reason handicapping doesn't work out to follow the theory is because of all these slight variables. And that's why in racing, when you're looking at form, you can be the best at the figures uh, and you can also know about the draw, but you've got to have an open mind about all these little factors that come in and you won't learn it overnight. You know, you've got to follow it every day. When they were coming together with this idea for time form, how long did it take for them to kind of perfect it? So, you know, you said it was two men, wasn't it? And they added it. They, one was mathematician um, and then one did the form. How long did it take for them to get a very a, a good um, structure for people to follow? That's a very good question. And I don't know the real answer to it. I can't give you a specific answer, but I mean, Timeform was officially founded in 1948, um, but it was going in um, one shape or another or um, with Mr. Bull's own uh, speed figures from at least uh, eight, 10 years before that. But it took a long time to develop. And then when did it become a well-known company? Not until the early sixties. So it was a long time in the making. Because it's not just time form, is there? There's loads of other data analysis for form, isn't there? The time form is, or, or was, well, I don't know why I say was. Time form is um, a, a way of fitting horses together that Phil Ball and Dick Whitford um, uh, formulated. When the Racing Post started in the mid 80s, one of its founding members was a man called Graham Rock who used to work at Timeform with me. Sadly, he, he died relatively young, Graham. Um, and he also, when he was at Timeform, he specifically worked for Phil Ball. So he adopted that, the same sort of scale for the racing post, though they used it. And then eventually in the, in the mid eighties as well, uh, the, uh, the jockey club, which then became BHA and BHB, they adopted it too. And you'll find that um, most handicaps around the world are run, if not identically, in a similar way. Because it, it's a simple way of actually putting them together. Throughout the world then, everyone is going by the same structure of form. The same principles, yeah, that are similar structures. Okay, so it doesn't differ depending on what country you are. Because I always wondered, you know, does it, does it make a difference if a horse is bred in, say, I don't know, Australia? to Britain, is, is there a difference in, especially with climate and things like that? That's why I wondered if the form um, structure would be different. It, it, that, that's a really good question. It's an interesting one. I mean, obviously when I started at Timeform, international racing that you take for granted was, un, was unheard of. You know, in, in 65, a couple of American horses came over to run in the Ark and you've probably read about a wonderful horse called Far Lap who went to America, but they, they were few and far between. Um, Val Marino was a very good horse in Australia who came and ran in the Ark in the 70s. But the idea that they flew around the world like William Haggis has, has just done with a day of, um, uh, and that happens um, quite a number of times a season now ju just didn't happen so how did they fit them together probably not very well initially um but now if you go on to the bha site which as i said to you uses a similar structure to time form it's not exactly the same but it's similar you will find that they have a weight for age system that adopts uh, and, and works with Australian or Southern Hemisphere horses as well. The same for Japan, the same for America, the same even for France. Now, are they as accurate? Are all those handicaps, can you just fit them together like they're a jigsaw? Um, probably not as carefully as that, but it, equally, it works better than you might imagine. As I said to you, racing's not exact, but it's approximate. So... Without, uh, without being rude here or, or starting to laugh, some, when I go on to this um, thing, uh, th th this strand of what I feel is so important about racing, people laugh, but it's logic if you think about it. Mm. Racing is governed by a breeding season. People say, oh, the season starts in March with the Lincoln. Well, it does, the, re the, the horse racing does, but the whole season starts 
um, with, with a breeding season, which starts on February the 14th and runs for six months. And then it starts in Australia on August, uh, the middle of August, and runs for, for, for six months there. Now, the average gestation period or pregnancy period for a, a thoroughbred broodmare is 11 months and one day. So horses are covered in that period in, in the Northern Hemisphere from February the 14th onwards, right? Mm -hmm. um, a six month period, and then the mare carries them for 11 months. So they're produced the following year. We don't actually want foals turning up on Christmas day, the 25th of December or the 26th or the 27th, or et cetera, et cetera. Because as you know, horses have their birthdays on the 1st of January, they become one. Otherwise, a horse five days old would become one, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you think about it, and this is why I don't want you to laugh, I'm not being rude. I'd say this to loads of people. Do you know when your mum and dad went to bed to produce you? I do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person that's ever answered like that. But anyway, most people don't. Mm -hmm. but, but with thoroughbreds, to be thoroughbreds, they have got to have registered thoroughbred records of eight generations of thoroughbred parentage. So that means you could trace if you wanted to, if you rang Weatherby's, the jockey club secretaries, said who you were, what you were doing, it's part of your project, they could show you the date, the stud in question would or could even tell you the time mm -hmm. of, of day that that union uh, took place to produce the horse that you now own and they can go back a minimum of eight generations. And if you think about Frankel, we can trace his parentage back 25 generations plus. We know exactly his, his heritage. We don't know all the times, but, but, but we will do though, we, we will know the times and dates for the last eight of them. So if you think, why is that important? Race horses are traceable because they're far more streamlined than humans. Most of us are the product of random mating. That's why we vary in size. But if you go racing tomorrow and you go and watch the two-year-olds in a paddock, yeah, some will be that much bigger than the others. But basically, horses weighing 450 kilos, because they're, they're young horses, and when they're, when they're older, they weigh more than that, obviously. They, they vary in size by a few inches. Yeah, you'll, you'll go to the races and you'll see someone a foot taller than you, a foot shorter than you. And that's because of the way they're mated. So they are far more traceable than you think. So to go back to that weight for age scale and Southern Hemisphere, Australia and things like that, they're produced the same way over there. So even though the climate's different, which you mentioned, and if you want a generalization, how do they differ Australian horses? Their sprinters are bigger and stronger as a generalization. And some might say a lot of them are faster as well, but that we won't get into that at the minute. But basically, they're, they're simple genetic facts. And ultimately, racing horses are a lot more traceable than you uh, and understandable than you might think. Hey!